time here. I'm going to give people just one more minute, and then I'll go ahead and start with introductions. And if you've just come in, welcome. This is the first evening event for Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago's Black History Month celebration. Um, we have a wonderful group of panelists um, to talk about Black joy. And in just a minute, I will begin doing the formal introductions and we'll get started. All right, being as how it's a couple of minutes after 7.05, people will probably still be streaming in, but I wanna go ahead and get us started. Um, we have a wonderful 90 minutes of great panelist conversation lined up for you. So let's get into it. Um, my name is Denise Rector. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a third year PhD student here at LSTC, Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago, um, on the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park. Um, on behalf of the organizers of our celebration and on behalf of LSTC, I would like to welcome you all to this wonderful panel on Black Joy. Um, I wanna take a moment and thank all of the organizers and the visionaries and everyone who has worked so tirelessly behind the scenes to put all of this together. And also thank you to the groups that are partnering with LSTC to co-sponsor this celebration of Black History Month. Um, we have co-sponsoring with us the Metropolitan Chicago Synod of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We also have partnering with us the Metro Chicago chapter of the African Descent Lutheran Association. And we have LSTC's anti-racism transformation team. So we're very glad to have those sponsors on board. Um, this is the first um, evening event, but it's not the last. If you are interested in learning about our other events, um, please Google LSTC Black History 2021. LSTC Black History 2021, and you'll get more information there about our other events. Tonight, our panel is discussing the topic of Black joy, which just feels like a necessity to me and maybe to many of you out there. While we celebrated the inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris recently, we also had to slog through the past administration. And unfortunately, assaults on the Black body and the Black psyche continue to be a common occurrence. As Black people, we're disproportionately impacted by the global pandemic on multiple fronts. So where do we find hope? And as a people, where do we find joy? To help us answer and discuss some of those questions, um, I, I am delighted to welcome our panelists. I'm going to read a brief bio of each of them. Um, first, I'll introduce to you Dr. Nicole Anderson Cobb. Um, Nicole Anderson Cobb, PhD, is a researcher, educator, activist, journalist, award winning playwright, and community volunteer. And she grew up on Chicago's Southeast Side in the Calumet Heights community. And she earned a bachelor's degree in political science, a master's degree in history, a second master's in journalism and a doctorate in philosophy of history from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. As a university professor, Dr. Anderson Cobb taught Africana studies and film media studies at Occidental College, Augustana College, Jackson University, Roosevelt University, and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She is wife and mother of a daughter. Additionally, she serves several civic organizations and volunteers within her sorority, Appa Kappa Alpha Incorporated. Her, she is also involved in her daughter's parent-teacher organization and provides troop support for her local Girl Scout troop. And in her free time, free time, she enjoys reading, traveling, dancing, visiting museums and cultural attractions, and spending time with her family. Um, next, I'll introduce to you Dr. Shauna Payne-Gold. 
um, Dr. Gold is educator and owner of Gold Enterprises, L Gold Enterprises LLC. Um, she's an educator, a higher education administrator, an ordained minister, and a highly sought after consultant in the diversity, representation, equity, and inclusion marketplace. She currently serves as the assistant provost for diversity and inclusion at Towson University near Baltimore. Her primary goal is to support the division of academic affairs by attracting, advancing, and retaining diverse staff, faculty, and librarians. Working in tandem with the Office of Inclusion and Institutional Equity and the Office of Human Resources, Dr. Gold is responsible for compliance, analytics, hiring, onboarding, funds development, faculty retention, and cultural competency programs. Within the role, she serves as a train the trainer for difficult dialogues using the University of Michigan's racial reconciliation model. She is also an instructor in the College of Education's Instructional Leadership and Professional Development Department, teaching courses for teachers, principals, and administrators. Dr. Gold holds a Bachelor of Business Administration from James Madison University, a Master of Divinity from Eastern Mennonite University, and a Doctor of Education from the George Washington University, as well as a Project Management Certificate acquired at Harvard University. She has two amazing sons, and in her lack of spare time, she's a four-time Ironman 70.3 triathlete, an endurance swimmer, swimmer, and a marathon runner. Next, I will introduce to you Rosella Ide White. She is the hashtag love big coach, a public theologian, a spiritual life coach, a leadership consultant, inspirational speaker, and writer focused on nurturing love that is life-giving, justice-seeking, and sustaining. Rosella is the owner of RHW Consulting, LLC, an agency focused on accompanying clients as they align their being, beliefs, and behaviors in order to deconstruct and dismantle systems, structures, and social constructs that inhibit justice and liberation. Rosella obtained her Master of Arts in Religion with Honors from LTSP, Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and her Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and African, African Studies, cum laude, from Texas Southern in Houston, Texas. She receives her certification in youth ministry from the Center for Youth Ministry at Wartburg Theological Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa. Rosella has also completed four units of chaplaincy training with Emory Center for Pastoral Services in Atlanta, Georgia, and is a certified disaster chaplain. She is the author of Love Big, The Power of Revolutionary Relationships to Heal the World, and has written numerous articles, curriculums, and resources focused on community development, leadership, and justice steeped in a love ethic. Rosella is a contributor to A Rhythm of Prayer, a collection of meditations for renewal. Next, I introduce Reverend Wells. Reverend Ant Lamont Anthony Wells is the program director for campus ministry in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America um, for campus ministry Lumen. Lumen is a network of inclusive faith-based and service communities on or near campuses at over 240 colleges and universities across the country. He is also the current national pre president of the African Descent Lutheran Association, affectionately known as ADLA. Reverend Wells is the former assistant to the bishop slash director for evangelical mission in the Metropolitan New York Synod. In his career, he has led programs and communities of multiple denominations in New York, Pennsylvania, and Georgia including having served as the Lutheran campus pastor for HBCUs in the Atlanta University Center. He most recently earned a professional certification in diversity, equity, and inclusion from Cornell. As a professionally trained coach, he effectively helps individuals, groups, and organizations to unlock their potential and maximize their performance. Previously, he earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Religion and Sociology at Morehouse, 
He also earned a Master of Arts in Christian Education and a Master of Divinity degree in Leadership from the Interdenominational Theological Center. He completed clinical pastoral education at Emory. Pastor Wells has studied leadership at Harvard, Princeton, and he was also named a clergy fellow of the Chautauqua Institute. A dynamic speaker and prophetic preacher, he is frequently called to address organizations, churches, conferences, convocations, retreats, and workshops. His prophetic message of ecumenism and social justice motivates him as a leader, a team builder, and a community organizer. So I told you we had a fantastic, amazing panel. I'm, I'm just, I'm so overjoyed to have them with us. And I'm going to jump right into the questioning. So we have a list of five or six questions that will hopefully start conversation and generate some cross conversation between our wonderful panelists. Um, let's see, I am going to ask Reverend Wells to start this particular round. Um, but, I'm, but I would like all the panelists to answer this question. How would each of you describe black joy? Is it self-care, resistance, or something else? And Reverend Wells, if you would, if you would kick us off in our conversation. So again, thank you for the invitation and it's uh, good to be here. Um, and I love that I'm in the company of all of these beautiful sisters, amen. And it's just an awesome thing, I, I think it's great. Um, for me, and I'm going to be very short because I want to hear so much from all of them, uh, Black joy for me is resistance um, because there is so much anti-Blackness in the world um, that I uh, confront or experience or um, am, am challenged by. Oftentimes for me, uh, my Black joy comes from a level of confidence in the midst of struggle and hope in the midst of pain. For me, Black joy is culture, arts, and everything. Like, Black joy for me is like um, uh, Frankie Beverly and Maze. Like, that's immediate. That's like any Frankie Beverly and Maze song is Black joy, especially before I let go, right? Like, that is just like, it brings such a great joy. For me, Black joy um, is eating, some people may not like this, chitlins one time a year because it's a part of a tradition that my family has. It's a Philly cheesesteak from Pagano's down the street on Ogons Avenue. Like Black Joy for me is like having that high spiritual service from some of the greatest orators ever that have walked the face of the earth. The, uh, the Gina Stewart's, the Iona Locks, like getting to those celebratory moments is that... Um, I almost said erotic, but it's also it's also kind of that kind of um, superlative of of spirit of excellence and um, and great great sense of pride. Um, but it's also for me um, a, a sense of understanding that because there's so much pain in the world, that it is the countercultural option that I have to survive. Wonderful. That is a wonderful, um, wonderful answer. And I won't call on folks every time because I really would like the, um, the conversation to flow. So um, if one of our other panelists feels moved by that and wants to respond and add, please do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on all of that. And, and part of it for me is that Black joy shines when it's darkest. You know, I, I think that's what's most important about it. The majority of um, what I've reflected on and experienced, even in the last year, um, especially in the last year, it's caused more joy. And I think that's what the difference is. And I don't know if we're going to go here with this, but I think we should at some point, is to think about, you know, what are the differences between joy and happiness? Because joy has a different connotation for me, especially in the context that is not so pleasant. Um, as y'all heard in, in my bio, I'm, I'm a swimmer. I do a lot of different things. And one of the things when I know that I'm performing my best and the times that I'm happiest is actually when I'm swimming against the current, not when I'm swimming with it. Because I realize that I'm paying attention to the, my surroundings. I'm at my best game. It's easy to swim with the current. You don't even have to do anything, frankly. Mm -hmm. But when I'm swimming against the current, knowing that everything has been set up to see me fail 
everything has been set up to make sure I don't have a smile on my face. Everything has been set up so that I can't find the humor in something small that happens. When you get to laugh in the face of constant diversity on top of diversity, all of this adversity on top of adversity, then what does that look like exactly? I think that's what makes it countercultural and resistant at the same time. So, you know, my brother Wells over here, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think that's what makes joy so poignant because it's easy to have joy when everything's all right. And the majority of our experience has not been all right. It has been. So we have to find what's, what's all right. And we have to sometimes create what's all right. So, you know, making those chitlins when that's all you had and making joy out of it and making them taste good, that's your joy. Or knowing that you're going into an environment where people in your surroundings, sometimes even in your seminary may not care for you and you still have to resist and put that smile on your face that they're not expecting. So I think the um, when we have black joy, it's almost the fact that everything around us tells us that we shouldn't have it and we have it anyway. To me, that's black joy. So that resistance piece is crucial. So I'm with you, Brother Wells, on that entirely. Um, it is resistance for me. If I could just pick up on um, Dr. Gold's observation about um, just building on both comments, but I wanted to just uh, kind of plant a flag on her observation about darkness. Um, it's interesting because as I was, you know, kind of reflecting on uh, beginning to prepare, I was here cooking dinner, making lunch for my family. And I just had this, I began to think about, well, I, what I believe the spirit said, while you're thinking about black joy, well, what, what does joy mean actually? I and mean, what does the Bible have to say about joy? And it's interesting because as I went and kind of, you know, did a little etymological work, um, it speaks so, so to what Dr. Gold is saying about the word joy, the origin of joy from that term semach you know, that in Hebrew, and the, and it's translated as gladness, as mirth, and literally joy is translated as to be bright, um, and thus the, my choice of attire on tonight, you know, so I was just moved by, you know, kind of biblical references to the idea that joy is um, about brightness of spirit, um, which so moves me, but also reminded that joy is about exactly what Brother Lamont talks about in terms of activity. You know, the New Testament reference to joy is about um, rejoicing. It is about exhorting. It is about leaping, dancing, singing. And that is so much a part of the African-American tradition that I was just encouraged in thinking about Black joy. Because from my own personal vantage point, joy is about freedom without regret. But as I mind the text and begin to think about how joy is defined, it took me back to that, to, to what we hear mothers talk about, that joy, unspeakable joy, this joy I have, um, this joy that I have that man can't take away from me. And so it just made me proud again for our African-American ancestors who brought joy, life, dancing, singing, shouting into the worship and that we be proud about the way that they inhabited joy for us to continue to experience on today. I love how the spirit moves, right? As we are responding to this and how each one is picking up off of the last one. So first and foremost, Black Joy for me is exploring Dubai in the middle of the night at 115 degrees with my brother Lamont. Um, <laughs> and eating at an amazing restaurant or is partying it up in Cape Town in Johannesburg or is engaging fun times in the States, right? So there is this embodied reality of joy. But first and foremost for me, Black joy is, is our birthright, quite frankly. My name is Rose Ella Rosella Ide White. I'm named for my paternal grandmother whose name was Rose Ella, the granddaughter of sharecroppers from Capron, Virginia who migrated up to New York and began to birth the first of seven children at 14 and went on to work and create and provide for her family, right? And I'm also the, the granddaughter of Ive Gisela um, and a daughter of immigrants from Panama and Jamaica and ultimately Puerto Rico. Um, and I believe that by fully embodying who I am, the skin I'm in and honoring the legacy of my ancestors, right? I am called to embody joy. 
there is no reason why or how I could be descendant of these women and of these families and not engage this life of joy. There is no reason that I could be descendant of slaves, of those who were enslaved and not embody joy. There is no reason that I can have this skin at 40 years old and not be joyful, right? And also the, the connection to light, right? I, I very much join with you, sister, uh, Dr. Anderson Cobb with the, the light, right? I chose this lip color because it gives me joy, right? I am smiling because I am full of joy just being here with you all tonight and hearing the accolades among us and engaging this time, which is holy time. And so yes is the short answer, um, Denise, to your question of is Black joy, resistance, resilience, liberation, freedom? Yes, and it is my birthright, plain and simple. Wow. Just the panorama from, from music and food, so these experiential things, to spiritual, um, to what is ancestral, um, bringing in the exegesis piece, um, just, just so, just what, what a, what a, um, what a full, a fullness to our legacy. And so, given, given this fullness, um, how do we access this joy, given the current zeitgeist? You know, given this global pandemic, given these assaults on the black body. Um, and I'm going to, this is really two questions, but I'm going to put, I'm going to put them together and, and let, and let the panel riff. Um, so how do we access joy given the current zeitgeist and how do we claim our black joy in white spaces, um, online spaces, worship spaces, all, all these sorts of spaces. And Dr. Gold, would you mind starting um, starting our conversation around these topics? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, again, I, I just want to keep, you know, plugging away at the point of the unexpected joy that, that Black people often bring to their experience, that we can laugh in times where we shouldn't really laugh. Um, some of the things that were, frankly, robbed from us, even in the last year, for example, we have to be very real that um, globally, obviously, we've been facing an entire pandemic, and many of us who come from Black traditions, African traditions, African-American traditions, were robbed of the celebrations of homegoings, for example. Um, for me, my uh, paternal grandmother passed in April, and it was not due to COVID, but it was during uh, the pandemic where we could not have a traditional homegoing. So I don't want to hear it when we talk about, oh, well, we have to wait a year or we have to wait longer in order to have a proper homegoing. Oh, no, I had my own homegoing right here in my home. I played all of my favorite music. I danced and cried and, and smiled and laughed all over my own house because I don't need a full gathering in order to have my own home going um, or to celebrate a life. And so given that, you know, I do think that, you know, in spaces and in situations and contexts that actually work very hard to throw cold water on black joy, that's when we have to find it more often, right? And we have to find it in everything. I love, Rosella, I, I love your lip color because that's the exact reason why I pulled out my favorite scarf, right? Um, so, you know, all of these ways in which we find joy even in the smallest things. Um, one of the things that I do on a regular basis is frankly, I'm, I'm not a comedian, but I do laugh. I, I look for every opportunity to smile and laugh and find the joy in something that might seem very dark. Um, and with that, I think it's an opportunity for us every day to look for something that makes us smile, to look for something that brings us levity. And, and for me, I, I've experienced those moments where I can legitimately say that I felt joy, even as tears rolled down my face, I still felt joy. And that's when you come to an intimate, as we said before, a very holy place where you can find both of those at the same time that you can find yourself over the moon happy despite everything around you saying that you shouldn't be. And so I think it's a responsibility to be forceful with seeking our joy, whatever that may look like. Um, one of my mentors feels very strongly that at the beginning of your day, you need to decide what your joy or what your reward is going to be at the end of the day. I don't care if it's a, a two ounce piece of chocolate, then that's my black joy for the day because I have made sure that I have this thing to work towards in order to maintain my levity. 
to remind myself of who I am and what I'm both responsible for and what I have a right to at the same time. And so I think it's something that it sounds like work, but once you've done it, the rewards are so great. Because I look around, I remember an author that once said, I'm not quite sure how any Black person can be mentally strong and healthy without Black joy. And so given that, you, you have to look for it. You have to seek it. You have to build it sometimes. And given that, that means you have to take an active role in the process of either finding your joy or building your joy, one of the two. And so given that, it's something that we don't get left off the hook for. You know, we, we don't get off the hook of finding our joy. Um, sometimes it brings us peace. Uh, sometimes it brings us momentum. But whatever that may be, we have to actively seek it because it may not come to us. So therefore, we have to go after it. And I'm very okay with that. And I make it my business to go after Black Joy every day, every day. Thank you for that, Dr. Dr. Gold, because I'm, I'm thinking of two things in particular. One is um, this notion of joy directly connected to, to freedom and liberation. Um, so that's something that's just moving around. I'll probably come back to that at some point. But the second to the, you know, thinking about how do we access this? One of the things that I do as a coach is invite people to get to know themselves and not just love themselves, but to fall in love with themselves, right? Those are two different things. There, there are people we love and there are people we've been in love with. Um, and to, to, to engage the journey of falling in love with yourself helps you to get to know what does bring you joy or when you feel joy because you're actually stopping and feeling the feels and reflecting, right? So this notion of um, accessing it to me begins with or includes the journey of actually coming to know and love yourself, right? So I know what I need to access joy. You know, I need my friends and family. I need those hilarious group chats. I need Black Twitter. I need every meme that could come up ever for every event, right? I need sex, right? There are things that I know that I need that help me to access joy. And I know that I need those things because I've also engaged the work of, of getting to know myself, of getting to fall in love with myself. And I think one of the greatest lies of white supremacy that many of us who are embodied in black bodies um, have believed to our detriment is that to get to know oneself and to fall in love with oneself is a, a privilege that we're not afforded. And the reality is, is that, um, again, I go back to the ancestral legacy. Our people did not build this country for us to not engage the deep work of knowing and loving who we are and not just as individuals, but as a collective. So for me, the accessing has both the internal component of what am I doing to get to know myself, to love myself, to be in love with myself, but also the external component of, it's really hard to be in a group of black folks and not just be laughing until you're crying. Like it's really hard to engage us collectively with our language, our vernacular, our passions, the way that we, we engage with our experiences and not laugh. So there is, for me, the internal and the external, the personal and the collective that go with this. And I think lastly, I would say, claiming it in white spaces for me is about, again, the freedom of being who I am. I don't actually need to claim it. I just bring it with me, right? It's not something that's out there. No, it's something that's in here. And I think that for me is really important with this internal work of if I believe that I was implanted with the image of the divine, I was made in the Imago Dei, like all of these things are true within me. Joy is also true within me. And I don't have to seek it out of outside of me. I can find it within. So then the question becomes, how are we engaging the work to find the joy within um, to uncover that? And I because I'm a love big coach, believe that it does begin with love and not romantic love, but love that is creative, liberating and sustaining. Thank you for that. Rosella, for me, like I, I, I resonate with that because for me, black joy is not always, um, my black joy is not always luxurious, right? And it's not always easy to maintain, right? Like it's something that I, I work at and that I, and, and for me, I'm going to do everything that I can to hold on to it. Uh, uh, Dr. Nicole, like I'm with you. The first lady of gospel taught us long time ago, this world, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. Like we got, that's an anthem, right? We have to hold on to that and keep that. 
But for me, I think the the what I experienced as I thought about this, my joy has even shifted, right? And I'm glad for that, right? It's not like, you know, I, I, I love um, sweet tarts and I used to eat so much of them like over and over and, and, and too much of anything is not good for you, right? So, well, that's what they said. But the but for me, my joy has shifted. I remember, and I'm an only child, like my family system as far as I'm an only child and I'm an only grandchild, right? So I everything I wanted, I you know, people call it spoil. I, I think that's a negative thing. It's, it's my life story, right? And that's how I, I was engaged. Um, but I, 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 I used to enjoy, enjoy receiving things like getting things all the, like that, that, what, that's what brought me joy. But as I've grown and shifted and it's not about age or getting older, I'm very clear now that what brings me joy, particularly in the pandemic is being better to give than to receive, like helping others and supporting others. So what has brought me joy, um, is that I have had time in this pandemic um, during this time to call people who I haven't talked to in a while to restore relationships, to take time and be settled. Because again, things that can cloud our joy is the busyness of life and the pain that we experience. And I've been able to, um, I haven't sat on Rosella's couch or Andrea's orange couch, <laughs> but the reality is I've been able to unpack some of the things that was preventing some joy in my life, right? Like, you know, contacting um, aunts and great aunts who are now getting older, right? Because, and some of it was out of concern that, you know, I don't want any funerals to go to and thank God uh, would that no one, you know, directly close to me I, I has, has died. But it's the shift for me of understanding about my engagement with others, right? And not just about getting something or receiving, but what I can do for others. It reminds me of like, as a child, if you can remember a, like a setting at maybe Christmas, um, a parent sitting there just getting more enjoyment at seeing that child open the gifts, right? And it, that is that kind of element. Now connecting to Connecting that to being in white spaces. This is something that I work at all the time, every day. I asked myself, because I came out of the black church, right? I came out of many, I came out of almost every historical black church you can name. I've been Kojic, I've been National Baptist, you know, I've been grew AME. Like I have this whole barrage, like, and I mean in it, I ain't been by it, I've been in it. Um, and then came to this tradition, y'all pray for me. Um, and for me, I've asked the question and I've done some research and I really might even do some um, doctoral study work with this. Um, when I look at freedom that um, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen decided was necessary for them after being accosted there in St. George's Church and saying, this ain't for me. And then in, in mass, like I love the story, in mass, everybody got up and, and went out. It was what I resonate with him um, in being in white spaces, having that self-determination. Um, uh, Karenga calls it Kuji Chagalia in, in, that, in that custom for the Kwanzaa principle, right? It's that self-determination that Absalom Jones had to not just leave one white space, start and engage as a healing for himself with Richard Allen, the African church that they founded and created, which was a black space, right? But then having the courage and the fortitude. Now, Richard Allen, and I love him, and sometimes I think I should be more like Richard Allen and go back to the black space and creating on my own black space, but went to the Episcopal church and with a sense of self-determination and fortitude and said, here I stand. He wasn't Martin Luther, but he said it. Here I stand and I can do no other but to do what's best for me and the people, the 500 people that I'm bringing. I mean, they were able to raise and congregate and to in, in, encourage people to support um, and be a part of a system that was against them. That's, that's a power. That's superpower. I don't, people were trying to get their superpowers back in December at the solstice or whatever. Black people been had superpowers. You hear me? And, and that, and that, and that one of those superpowers is that resiliency and that joy of that access to freedom and that self-determination. When, when Absalom Jones had, had bought himself out of slavery and all of those kinds of things, because he had that sense of 
a desire to move beyond his current circumstance and press forward and go on with, with a sense of fortitude. I love it. That's why I'm in this space. And that's why how I can, that's the only way that I can stay in this space is to be able to rise with my head up and go to 8765 West Higgins Road when I know there are people that want to call me the angry black man. They want to call me, you know, the 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 hard to get along with only because I call people out on their stuff. Oh, this is well, and you know, right, shit. So, but the reality is, um, it's having that fortitude and that confidence, and I'll keep it. They can call me whatever they want to call me. I'll keep it. I just need to build where my brother left off on this question of how the relationship between black joy and white spaces, because what I know is that one of the things that our white brothers and sisters do individually and as they exist in white institutional life is that they force us to reconnect with our black joy because they force us far too often to re-engage with our own humanity and make that plain for them. They force us to justify our thoughts, words and deeds and experiences. In white spaces, we are called to validate our experiences and ourselves on a constant basis in constant encounters. In white spaces, we are always called to defend our positions with evidence, all while maintaining positions, jobs, resources, and sanity. So in an odd way, black joy is strengthened. It is fortified in the cauldron of white spaces, as we make, our, we make our case to exist in these spaces. And again, we're always walking that line between self-preservation and truth telling for transformation. So that is where black joy is most operationalized in white spaces. The other thing, what, what I'll say about this question of what, what then do we do personally? Two things, there's a list, but, but, but two of the things I think is vital for us. I think it's important to start each day with a body scan. And what I mean by that is to, to, when you rise, take some time to figure out, am I here? Can I move, see, smell, hear, taste, touch, and feel? Um, because too often we're reaching for those devices that create worlds for us. And I think that we that the way that we have to balance the onslaught of what's coming at us is to take time first and foremost to be in our own bodies, to assess, to praise God for the ability of our limbs, as our elders would say, and to determine that what we are yet here with a work to do each and every day. And I say that I, I just did a 30 day yoga, um, yoga journey and, and it was revealing because it, it was, it was something, you know, you peek in and you see, and you say, okay, I'm gonna do that. And you know, you don't quite get to it, but it was so helpful because I had to get in this body, move this body, forgive this body, learn about this body and understand the force and the power that this body is capable of. And just all while breathing, uh, the theme was breath, right? And so, and that translated off the mat. So when I'm dealing with a school principal, I'm breathing. When I'm advocating at a, at, for elders at a nursing home, I am yet breathing. And so I, I think that you know, it is so, so much comes at us that we, we have to, again, first be able to, to ground ourselves in what is true for us today and what God is going to give us power to do in this day. But also that, that call to movement, we, we reminded that the word tells us that our joy is embodied. And I also think that we have to, we have to, last thing is that we have to make a determination of what media we're going to seek this day. We're going to do all the platforms. We're going to do the essential ones for, the, for our day of work. We're not going to do any because this is our day of rest. I think that we really have to 
we have to intentionally manage what we're consuming because it, like all other things, are going seek to consume us. So those are just a few things I want to kind of rest in the conversation. But now before we move on, I, I just want to underline what you were saying, Doc, specifically. You know, we need to be realistic about that cauldron that you brought up. Okay, we, we need to be very realistic about that cauldron because a true cauldron is something where people are, or, or something that you eat usually, but something is cooking in there, right? And there's a fire underneath of it that can burn and it can burn slowly and it can burn strong. And a true cauldron has a lid on it, which means it's very tough getting out of that thing. We in it, we're kept in it. In fact, there's a system created to keep us in a certain place where we feel this rising heat. And mm -hmm. my concern is that if we don't acknowledge that while we're seeking out our joy and doing that body scan, we have to acknowledge that this cauldron is not natural, right? Absolutely. This cauldron Absolutely. is not natural. It's not where things thrive, mm -hmm. right? And so given the, acknowledging that cauldron, and then the, the other piece I was going to mention too is that joy does not have to be performative okay. so i'm not saying you got to walk around as much as I, I love my sister's lipstick over here you do not have to slap on your lipstick if you don't feel like it to okay. perform that you're joyful when you are not okay. or if you do have joy your joy may be understated there have been moments where i had my deepest joys because i was actually in route to go see my lovely sister girl therapist and I was grateful that I had the means to go see her, that the bill was going to be paid, that I was going to come out with some strategies that I could go in knowing that I had somebody to have my back. So joy does not have to be a stereotype or performative in any way, even as we acknowledge this whole cauldron that we're in and maybe the mental state that we may possibly be in. We can hold all that at the same time. And it's complex. I know it's complex, but can we hold it all at the same time? I believe we can. Well, and to that point, I don't believe that I was put here to simply survive. I reject that premise, right? I believe wholeheartedly in thriving. And I think that, you know, I, I did leave my brother Lamont in a particular cauldron as it became clear to me, right, mm -hmm. that I was not, no, I was no longer able to show up fully, authentically, um, in a way that embodied, um, again, all of who I was and in a ways that, in a way that honored the values and the community that I felt most accountable to. And so I had to make the decision that that space was not the space for me, right? And so for me, this goes back to this work of being very clear about who we are and what we value and how we're called to be in this world, because I'm not here to survive. Right, I'm here to I'm here to thrive, like and with some style, in the words of Sister Maya Angelou. Right, I'm not just here to survive. Um, you know, survival is about the day to day, the getting through, and and recognizing that there's a reality in which people are just trying to survive. I I, I wholeheartedly recognize that. I come from parents that at one point in their life that was their reality, and I think again, going back to the ancestral lineage, going back to my own kind of evolution. Right, I'm here to thrive. I'm here to, to show another way, right? I'm here to embody my deepest held beliefs and values. And at some point I had to ask myself, can I do that within this cauldron of whiteness and white supremacy? Because the reality is, is that we're still in it, right? The world that we live in is that. But am I choosing <laughs> to place my body in a space that continues to do violence to my personhood that gaslights me Right, that doesn't honor who I am and does not seem to align with what they do with what they say, am I supposed to do that? Or am I supposed to, to thrive, to go beyond, to engage more deeply? So for me, that becomes really important. And yes, Shauna, I, I join with you, right? There, there is also this connection for me of joy that can't be missed with gratitude, Right. And so the the body scan, Nicole, the the practice of gratitude, right? These are things that I used to think of were like woo-woo. Oh, okay, whatever. And then over the last five years, right, the embodiment of those things, I mean, that that is hugely powerful. And I do work with some energy healing modalities. So also to the point of body scan, in the morning, part of my meditation is the protection, right? God, spirit, divine, energy, universe, please protect me 
as I engage in these spaces, as I engage with these people, as I engage in a world that has been set up, right, not for my flourishing, but for my harm. And, and to be able to do that energetically has made a difference. And also to do a cleansing at the end of the day makes a difference because we carry all of that. And we see generationally it has taken root and continues in this cycle of trauma. And so joy, gratitude, protection, connection, clarity about the places and spaces you are in that are really not for your thriving, right, become important as we engage this, this journey and this conversation. That was just overwhelmingly rich. I, 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 I tried to pick up a few points for the first round. There were so many points this round. Um, what, what I'm hearing about embodiment and about the body scan and about knowing your body is really resonating with me personally. Um, you know, we, um, we serve a God who chose to be here among us incarnate. And that is really, really important um, to consider um, how not only the cauldron affects our body, but how joy can bring healing and how community can bring healing. Um, along the lines of healing, um, I would like to bring up the topic of help, asking for help, whether it be family, friends, professional, workplace, um, if there are strategies along those lines that um, one can do to increase joy. Um, when is it, you know, when is it time to ask for help? Um, someone also mentioned being honest about your joy and honest about your emotion. You don't have to put on the lipstick if you don't want to, if you're not feeling it. Um, so questions about joy as denial versus authentic joy. And when you need help, um, what are some things that you can do? And I'll let anyone um, jump in after, after thought and start us off. Well, I, I know for me, um, asking for help sometimes is joy. Um, just the mere fact that I can articulate that I do need help. Um, being someone, uh, uh, Brother Lamont, I, I resonate with you. I'm also an only child as well as an only grandchild uh, on my maternal side. And so I'm used to doing things relatively on my own, getting things done, being very independent, being strong, um, whatever strong is, however you choose to define that. And so given that the asking of help seems counterintuitive, right, to someone who um, has been kind of groomed to not need help. Uh, to avoid help at all costs, to only ask for help when it's your last option, your last choice. And so the, the asking for help and being able to articulate that now has become more of a joyful process because I, I feel like I've developed because I can identify when I need it. That's the first thing, self-awareness, body scan. <laughs> Even in that, it's like, wait a minute, you need some help here. You can't just get up on your own. You need help. Um, so being able to identify when I need it the, the joy of articulating it to the person, because usually I'm very clear on who I'm asking. Um, if it's a human being, um, if it's the Holy Spirit, that's something different. That's a different conversation. Uh, but if I'm asking someone for help, um, knowing that uh, most likely that person is going to provide that help if it's in their, uh, in their ability to do so, um, and that they are going to help with great joy. Uh, because sometimes you ask an individual for help and it does not come with great joy. It comes with great sorrow. So how do we do that and do it well where it fosters a cycle of joy, if you will? Now, for me, when it comes to going into just prayer walk and prayer life in and of itself, asking for help is an ongoing thing, an ongoing process. It's something that's almost like the air I breathe. It helped me to do this or help me to avoid that or help me to, it, it literally is the way in which I move. And so given that, you know, somebody may see me over there mumbling, I'm, I'm not mumbling, honey. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking because I need to ask for some help, some support, even if it's some encouragement. And I remember um, I was reading this article once that said there's, um, there, there's three different types of prayer when it comes to help. It's help, which is just a basic help every day, all day. 
It could be help now as in I'm in trouble and I need some immediate help. And the third is say what? Meaning that I need clarification on what I need. And once I get more, as I get more and more clarification, my joy can even increase because then I have better direction. I have better clarity as, as to where I'm going or what I need to do. And so given that, I think the asking and the um, the joy that comes along with that additional support and clarity, you, you are not in this thing alone. And I think that's what's so powerful, the joy that comes with the companionship of the Holy Ghost for me. Um, so that companionship to me is my help and my joy all at the same time. And the mere fact that it's something I can access so regularly like air is in fact joy. And for me, it's black joy because um, given that, you know, going back to the, the cauldron is sticking with me right now, um, but the fact that I'm critically positioned in situations where I may have no choice but to ask for help, that in and of itself becomes a constant joy for me. Um, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, but again, it, just imagine being in situations where you don't need help, so you think, right? You're not even, fo you're not even forced uh, to seek out help. And so I, I appreciate that ongoing cycle like the air we breathe to access that joy and that it's available, the availability of that type of help and joy. Um, so that, that's what I do. Denise, can I, can I say too, on, on this question of, I, I believe you called it pro professional help. When I do did, I use that? that phrase, yes. And I, I wanna say that if you are a BIPOC, if you are a person of color in America, the answer is yesterday. The answer is right now. Yes, the answer is. is immediately, for, in my, for, in my um, you know, passionate opinion. I think we've got to be in a place to, to, be, to be willing to say that our families, our book clubs, our sorority brothers, our, excuse me, our sorority sisters, our fraternity brothers, our Bible study groups are not the, they love us. They are available to us, but they may not be the community that is professionally equipped to deal with that which we need to sort through. So I think that just like we, we try our best not to, not to let our bank account get low or our gas tank get low or our cupboards get low, we have to treat our mental health in the same fashion. And so we just wanna be able to, to liberate folks to make mental health care a part of your maintenance, a part of your regular everyday ordinary maintenance, no judgment, it ain't nothing special or particular. It is that which we need in this America to maintain ourselves. So we, we gonna go ask our doctors for referrals the next time we go. We're going to look at online resources. We are gonna check out therapy for black girls and, and spend our 9.99 in that community and get some support. We are gonna look at what Taraji is doing and her um, Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation and understand that she has free classes, local classes, youth driven classes for mental health. And we're going to call the NAMI hotline. Anybody need it, it's 1-800-950-NAMI. If you, or text NAMI at 741741. Or perhaps we need the suicide prevention line at 1-800-273-8255. So again, we just want to liberate our people, help them to know that me the mental health piece is so crucial. We lift it up, we support you. We may have to drive folks or, or sit with them or sit outside the house as they have the appointment. But we want our folks to feel free to seek that, to seek those services for their overall health and well being. Uh, Dr. Rosella, Nicole, like. The, yeah, thank you for the wealth of information you're putting in the chat, Rosella. I'm sorry. Lamont, please. No, no. It, for, for, I, I resonate with that as, as well. But some of that stuff, to get to that place, we have to, I had to unlearn some things, right? Because I come out of a ch tradition, like a cultural tradition that, um, that taught me to push, right? To pray until something happens or to praise my way through it and shine on my shot, you know, and get and make that and, and you know, and you shout and, and that's what we do, range all that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and that kind of gives us um, an exertion of some level of, of, of energy, but um, one of the greatest gifts that I had at a certain point um, in my life 
was uh, while I was in seminary. So I had all those years of childhood education and, and you know, just giving it, having a talk with Jesus, telling them all about my troubles. He'll hear your faintest cry, answer by and by. Sometimes I didn't get the answers that I need, even when my prayer wheel was turning and the fire was burning. But the reality is when I learned and got to seminary, my seminary professor, um, homiletics, uh, Dr. Mark Lomax, who pastored, uh, he might have retired now as the uh, pastor First African Presbyterian um, Church, right? Beautiful church. Um, he taught, he said to every class, like uh, we supposed to be learning homiletic. He said, all y'all selves, if you know Mark Lomax, you know what he said. All y'all selves need to get a therapist. He would spend time every class talking to us preachers about the stuff that we were preaching. And, and I wondered why until I, I, I start needing to um, go to therapy myself and I made it a part of, and everybody can't necessarily afford it, right? But um, it needs to be a part of my reg regular regimen of, of living. So it's, a, it's in my toolkit of, of engaging. But what that brings up for me, especially those of us who are in um, the preaching traditions and particularly in the ELCA, I serve as the national president of ADLA, right? So I do a lot of advocacy for um, our black leadership and, and congregations. So I had a conversation with Portico one time, which is our healthcare um, uh, institution or engages with that. And I was like, you know, how can we support black mental health? Right, they're only they're less than two hundred pastors or leaders, rostered leaders in the in the EOCA. Right, I ain't talking about the sixteen thousand. I'm talking about us right now. Right, what about the intentional investment? Because there were disparities between what what um, the 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 pressures that um, leaders of color were receiving, or, or black leaders in particular um, were receiving. Um, and he talked to me about that, but the reality is people weren't even using the six free sessions that we had as a part of our, um, you know, healthcare. So I realized that I had to do some work and intentionality in synods and other regions to encourage people to get on those couches or those chairs or benches, whatever your, your therapist has, and now on Zoom, you know, um, and, and to release that stuff. And I'm going to tell you, it has made me a better preacher. It has made me, uh, 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 it has helped me to release all kinds of things when there are other habits that I could have engaged or, you know, where that joy turns into sorrow oh, because I engage into those other things. So it, that therapist, so I, I'm very clear about the professional help. Go get it, keep it, keep it on speed dial and keep it on hand. And now, you know, it's sexy right now to have a coach. And that's good. I want us to have coaches, but I'm talking to a coach and a therapist is not the same thing. So I don't need somebody just to encourage me to be my best self. I need somebody to help me to unpack and to heal and to, to make those things that are not right within me whole again. Yeah. So that I, I mean, can bear in, the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're in my, this is so much my lane, partially because when I started in the blogosphere, probably in 2009 or 10, I was coming out of a major depressive episode and I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder along with generalized anxiety disorder. And then later found out I also have ADHD, which explains so much for anyone who knows me, um, but started, uh, I created a platform called Embracing My Shadow. And it's incredible to see how long, how quickly things have changed, right? Because in 2011, I could barely find a black voice that was speaking loudly about all of these issues as it related to black mental health. And so to see, you know, so many of the folks that that I follow and that I engage, you know, my therapist is one of the co-founders of Melanin and Mental Health. I mean, there's so many spaces and places now that focus on black indigenous people of color and not just talk therapy, right? Because I want to also make a distinction to Lamont's point, right? Coaching and therapy is different. And I explain this to clients all the time. Coaching is about getting you where you want to go. Therapy is about unpacking the bags and dealing with the shit that's stopping you from getting where you want to go, right? So I, I have both. You need both. And then I would also add in a spiritual director, right? For those of us who are in that lane as well. Mm -hmm. But for me, one of the things that I'm very clear about is that a, there's been the stigma, so we need more people to tell their stories that look like us, right? So I'm Rosella Ide White. I live with major depressive disorder. I'm on um, Lexapro. I was on Prozac for five years and moved over to Lexapro, and that keeps the fog at bay. And then my engagement with my, like, 
exercise, though, it's, it's, it's falling off right now, but my yoga, my meditation, all of those things become a part of the maintenance, right? But the other thing that I've recognized is for many of us, sometimes we have out-talked talk therapy, right? Everyone on this panel is brilliant. People who are watching are brilliant. I can talk through stuff to my therapist and tell my therapist what I think, what I know, what she wants to hear. But the body doesn't lie, right? like the famous book, The Body Keeps the Score. And so also seeking out other modalities for maybe if you're a person where talk therapy doesn't work or you've outgrown it, right? What does energy healing look like? What does somatic um, support look like? Because I think for many of us in the Black community, the talking may not get us where we need to get as it relates to our unlearning and the healing, but our bodies, right? Our bodies, which have borne the brunt of trauma, which continue to carry the trauma um, to engage the body might actually be something that releases something within you that you didn't even know was there. And so I, when we talk about professional help, I think, yes, talk therapy is a like, yes, right? Body therapy, somatic things that you engage, especially by someone who it, it works in that field. And I feel like Prentice Hemphill, and there's some others out now that are really doing this. Resma Manikim, who I'm um, using for a lot of my racial anti-racism stuff, talks about the bodies and how trauma lives in that. And so we can't negate, right, as Black people, first of all, we must be, I don't know what it is. I don't want to use a superpower motif, but we must be brilliant, and I don't mean brilliant intellectually, I mean holistically, because our bodies have not only endured, but metabolized and not necessarily metastasized, right, the trauma. Um, and yet there is still a need for us to engage the work. And then I think the other thing that I, I'm coming back to, I write about in my book, and I'm continuing to build on this metaphor of wound care, right? So when we talk about joy, you know, we talk about all of the things that we need to access that, but there's also that underlying piece of, what does it mean to experience the joy and deal with the pain? And again, metabolize the pain, but not just allow it to metastasize. And I, I think about wound care, right? So the first thing with wound care, you know, if someone's bleeding, first thing you do is find where the blood is coming from and you stop the bleeding, right? That's the first thing. And I think for many of us, that's about all that we've been able to do. That's about all that society has allowed us to do. But that's the first step. The second step is around the cleaning out the wound and the inflammation that takes place to protect the wound. And to clean out the wound, I was one, uh, one of the caregivers for my grandmother who had a, a leg amputated. That shit is painful, right? The debriding, the pouring in of the different antiseptics and the ointments and the really getting down to clear out whatever the root of the wound was in order for something new, because it's something new, it's not the same thing, in order for something new to be revealed. Then the third step is proliferation. When new vessels, new skin, all of that newness comes over because now it's freshly cleaned in order to cover the wound, right? And then the last part is just the notion that you tend the wound. What was wounded, at least without God, is never 100% back to what it was before, right? That's why there are consistent inju injuries among athletes, right? That's why if you have a, a bum knee, like that knee will continue to be a bum knee unless you do something to, to fix it. And so part of, for me, the impetus for talking about Black joy is also to invite people exactly into this space, to recognize those things that may impede the joy or those things where the joy might cover, right? Especially if it's that performative joy that Shauna was talking about, the joy might cover that deep and profound pain. And the last thing I'll share is, I, I mean, I, I'm a smiler. Like I, I say my smile is my moneymaker and it just exudes from me. But I've come to recognize that those of us with the biggest smiles are also harboring some of the darkest and deepest pain. And so it's not the one or the other. They're not mutually exclusive. And yet, right, the gift of deeply engaging the pain and the grief. We had six people in our family die last year, right? Six, six funerals, six non-funeral, six Zoom thing, right? Like that grief was damn near untenable. And it was the joy that came from gratitude, the joy that came from healing practices, the joy that came from community, the joy that came from the fact that my mind, I didn't lose my mind, right, that kept me going, but I had to both engage the grief and the pain and the trauma as much as I engaged the joy. So for, for me, these things go directly handed or they're directly correlated. Mm. You're reminding me of something that um, 
my therapist has been walking me through because one of the things that I do in my day job at the university is um, I actually facilitate difficult dialogues. And during the time of severe unrest in this country in mid-June or so, right after George Floyd had been murdered, I mean, the list of social unrest goes on and on in 2020. Um, but during that time period, we held spaces based on racial groups, and I was the one that held space for Black groups. And what was so interesting to me was without me having to prod at all, the common theme throughout all of those dialogues was fatigue, flat out tiredness. These folks did not have enough energy to find joy or happiness for that matter, because they were so emotionally, physically, mentally, all the things exhausted. And so looping that back in, that's one of the things I so appreciate about my therapist who has walked me through her seven types of rest, because there are different types of rest. I'm thinking, okay, I just need to sleep a little bit more. Look, as soon as this COVID lifts, I can get on the plane and go somewhere. I'll rest later. Well, she's saying, let's embrace these different forms of rest now. And she goes down these different forms, creative rest. So something that inspires you. I'm thinking of my good girlfriend who she's now, um, uh, she's now upgrading things. So she's taking clothes and she's, uh, recycling them into gorgeous gowns and dresses, for example. That has been her creative outlet, for example, and she is in Chicago as well. Mental rest. No, you do not need to read that set. Look, I, I love former President Barack Obama, but if you don't feel like reading his 700 page book, then don't read the doggone thing. Let it sit there. You'll be all right. You can get back to it, okay? So what, what is your mental rest? Physical rest. For some people, physical rest is actually exercise. For me, it is um, freeing and restful for me to go out and walk five or six or seven miles and do my thing. That's restful for me. But whatever is physically restful for you, yoga, like you mentioned, Sora, before, that is your rest. Social rest, you already talked about that too as well, Sora, around who are you around? Because let me tell you something, people will suck up your energy, all of your energy. So determine who you're around. I decided, especially during 2020, there were some people who I love and adore that I had to create some space. And not because I love them any less, but because I needed to rest. Being around them took energy for me that frankly, I did not have. And so I had to decide who's going to be in that smaller inner circle and who would not be in that inner circle. I had to get my emotional rest in. So I did a lot of journaling. I did a lot of reflecting and, and meditation even. I would take one scripture or one quote and sit with it for two or three days, just meditating on that one thing. So emotional rest for me, sensory rest. Think about how often we looking at this dog on Zoom screen. And I, I love to be with y'all right now, but think about it, especially in the beginning when we all were trying to figure out our work day. You know, some of our work days, we didn't have boundaries. We starting to hear the phone ping at five, six o'clock in the morning with emails and they don't shut down till seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. And we realize, oh my God, I haven't even had dinner yet. So the sensory repeat, having the lights on here and, and something dinging over there. I got my phone, my iPad, my tablet, my, everything's going on. Turn that stuff off. Do not disturb. It's on the doggone phone for, the reason, for a reason. Use it, use it. And then of course, the, the final one, of course, is spiritual rest. What is disturbing your spirit that you need to just put to the side? But even if you need to return back to it put, it, put it on a shelf somewhere and let it sit there. Let it sit there. And so with that, you know, I think my therapist is a genius on that. I had to flush it out a little bit for myself. But she said that was one of my major blockages to joy was that I was so exhausted in all areas. I didn't even have the energy to be joyous, even though I wanted to be. And so how are we protecting all of these different forms of rest so that we hold them despite what anybody thinks of them? And I know that's hard. You know, your girlfriends want to go do this, that, and the third, or they want to get on the Zoom call, or they want to do whatever. If you've been looking at the dog on Zoom for 12 hours, one more hour, no. I literally had to get new glasses because I had been looking at Zoom for so long that I had to adjust. My eyes even needed rest. So how much more does the soul need rest, right? So given that all of that, I'm trying to wrap my brain around. I hope y'all will do the same with me. But I think the rest piece has a lot to do with joy, just as you've mentioned about the healing as well, sister, that all of that ties in together. 
just just amazing. Yes, absolutely. Um, the things that get in the way of our joy and how do we how do we manage, how do we ask for help, whom do we ask for help um, to keep ourselves connected in ways that help to give us joy. Absolutely. Um, what methods and practices do you all utilize to claim your joy? I've heard a little bit about yoga. I've heard some therapy. Um, I've heard of a friend who does gowns. Um, what other sorts of what other sorts of um, activities do you turn to for joy? Yeah. Can you all hear me? Okay. I think my sound went out. You know, these things die when they don't want to work no more. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think about the practices or methods I use, you know, Shauna, thank you for much, so much for saying that because I am constantly coaching my clients to rest, just stop. And if they tell me they don't have the time, sometimes I say, well, you know what? We on the phone for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, you're going to rest right now. And they're like, what? Yep. No, no, go take a nap. I'll set a timer. It's fine. Like, because rest for me, is non-negotiable. Just as joy is non-negotiable, rest and healing are non-negotiable. So rest is absolutely a practice. Whether it be naps, whether it be one, one week a month, I don't schedule clients, right? So I use that week as a time to both catch up, to maybe do some deeper work, but also to not set an alarm. Like I'm not going to, to be up and out every day. Um, meditation for me is is now the, the form that my prayer life takes. So 20 minutes a day where I use both um, devotional texts, but also oracle cards and decks. And it's interesting because I've been exploring ancestral religions and ways of being. And as I started engaging the oracle decks, my mom was like, oh, you know, your grandmother was a reader of cards. And I never knew that, right? And it's been something that I've been exploring. Um, good food right? Eating, not just like things that taste good, but things that are good for you and that actually restore your energy, right? Because food is fuel. It's not just for us to enjoy. It actually fuels us. I have my little things. This water bottle right here, right? This is something that I use every day because sometimes I have, a, I'm getting a headache. I just need water. I just, right. So for me, it's the rest that then gets me in tune with my body and, you know, really pushing back. And this is something I ask clients all the time. Well, who told you that you couldn't, right. Or what's standing in the way of you from carving out a time? Because if you're telling me you can't take 30 minutes for you, an hour for you, then we've got to talk about some other things that are going on related to control and expectations and lack of boundaries. Because ultimately the question or the inquiry becomes what becomes possible when you're able to take that time to experience that moment of rest, that little bit of healing. And again, you may not start off with therapy, coaching, a full on nap, a week like that you're not engaging. That may not be where you start, but I guarantee you, you start with 10 minutes a day 10 minutes a day doing something for you, you will see a difference and that will in, in, in help you engage and embody. And then the last thing I'll say about this, I'm finding there's a direct correlation between the things that we say we want to be about in the world and how we're about those things within ourselves. So when I say that I want to be about compassion in the world, it also comes back to how compassionate I am with myself. If I want to be about restoration in the world, how is that happening with myself, right? There is this synergy and this interdependent relationship between how we want to be with and for others and how we are with and for ourselves. And I think that, you know, I, I often say that we quote the first and second commandment, love the Lord your God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself, yeah. right? And so what does it mean to love someone as yourself if you're not loving yourself, if you're not engaging these ways of being with self? I, I'm not quite sure how to love someone as myself. I think I can love when I maybe don't love myself, but to love someone as I love myself leads me into a much deeper reflective, um, accountable space that then I think makes all of this other stuff accessible. The joy, the connection, the thriving, right? So th those are just some of the thoughts when you, when you ask about practices or ways of being, Denise, that come up for me. Thank you. Thank you. Denise, for me, uh, it's, um, it's so um, 
Dr. Wimberly, Ed Wimberly, um, used to teach at ITC Provost, I believe. He talks a lot about reauthoring yourself or reauthoring narratives. And so I've had to reauthor the narrative because particularly as an activist and engaging in various things, um, like I was taught, like, you know, it's about the grind, stay on the grind and keep going. And that's how you get the energy and you keep going and you keep getting more energy. And I, I, and I was glad that I was able to talk to some of the, our now leaving us in just recent times um, in magnitudes, our civil rights leaders, um, C.T. Vivian. I was able to sit and talk with him and John Lewis and others. And particularly it was um, Reverend Jesse Jackson that taught, told me about what they used to do while they were in the movement and whatever. They used to sit in the hotels and play spades. Like they used to sit and play cards, right? And it makes sense. Like Dr. King, there's no way you went to Morehouse and didn't learn how to play spades, right? Like that's, that's how you survive or any black college for that matter. But I, I bring that up because the picture that we have of, of, of Dr. King and others and, and, and the other leaders that were serving with them is that they were always working and always going or whatever. I love those pictures. And, and so, you know, I have a dream and, you know, all the things like that. But what about those pictures of him on the beach at, um, you know, in the Bahamas? Now, I don't like that necessarily that I saw the pictures of him and Coretta fully dressed. Like, I would like to see some legs or something, right? But the reality is they got rest, right, at, in that kind of place. The other thing that I want to say about that, so changing that narrative, like reauthoring so that we understand that you can be in the movement, you can be in activism, which is a part of what we have to be in a part of our natural existence, right? Um, but the resistance to be countercultural to that and reauthoring that is to, to do something that gives you um, joy and to, and to reset and to recalibrate a actual Sabbath keeping. Yes, Pastor Angela. But also knowing you, and knowing what works for you. So I, I, mean, I can't tell you to go to a beach and make that manifest. Like for me, you know, people talk about, especially in other cultures, talking about going camping and all that kind of stuff and how they love, don't send me on no camping trip. I'm not sleeping in a bunk bed. That does nothing for me, right? But like water, I'm very clear that water you know, that when I go into the ocean, I'm going next week, like that manifests something. You and, and Dr. Uh, Shannon, y'all do swimming. Like that manifests something in my own body that sends a cleansing. I baptize myself in, when I go, go to, the, to the water um, for that. But also I know that going to amusement parks and riding on the Loch Ness Monster also gives me joy and great exhilaration. So it's a both and, but it's just about finding it. <laughs> it's just about finding that space for you, which is most important. So listening to people saying, oh, you've got to do this. No, you've got to learn you. Uh, Dr. Nicole talked about that and spend time with you to determine what makes that healing and what makes that best for you to manifest that and stick with that and ride with it. Indeed, indeed. Wow, we, um, we are coming up to our last few minutes. And this has just been such an amazing time. Um, I feel so fulfilled. I have, I literally have notes that I'm like, you know, um, I saw other, I saw someone else reaching for a piece of paper. Um, I hope that every, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I hope that um, everyone is taking, um, is watching what is happening in the chat. Um, there are some nice comments and um, support in the chat, but there are also phone numbers and websites um, that can be helpful um, as we, as we pursue joy. And as we pursue the things that may get in the way, as we, as we try to work around the things that get in the way of joy. Um, I do have one question from the audience. And unfortunately, we only have time for this one question, but I think it's an important one. And so panelists, if you could weigh in on this in a brief manner, um, then we will, we will um, give you our, our thanks and, and we will be done for the evening. And the question that we got um, came up during our discussion about professional help. Um, and we've talked about some of the stigma that, um, that is in 
the black community sometimes about mental health, about therapy, about issues like depression. Um, I live with depression. I have complex PTSD. I'm on medication. That is not something that I normally admit. I'm getting more comfortable admitting to people. There's still stigma around all of that. Um, the question that came in is how do we model a dialogue around holistic health for our congregations as a way to break down some of that stigma. So um, if there is a brief comment or two about that, that would be wonderful. Well, I'll just briefly weigh in. I know um, Dr. Nicole and I, Sora Nicole and I have uh, birthdays this month. In fact, uh, yours is today. Happy birthday to you. Um, but one of the things that has been modeled in, in my congregation in particular is um, it's a constant reminder at every public service that as we're doing our usual announcements, the senior pastor of our church reminds everyone, especially if it is your birth month, to do all of your checkups. I'm talking about all of them. Check your eyes, check your feet, check your mind, check your check everything, check everything. And I so love that model because um, it really normalized all of this. It really normalized every part of your being deserves a professional to give it attention. And so given that, why not have your mind checked out? Why not have your eyes, your everything checked out? And so that's been a regular model. And so even if it's not your birth month, it still is a, a reminder to you, oh, let me get that appointment down because you know it takes six months to see the dentist. Let me get this together. And so it, it's a constant reminder. And I'm so appreciative that that has now become an ongoing dialogue in our congregation. But now, who are you going to for your therapist? Who are you going to? But it, it, it's become this murmur that is now a full-blown conversation that's just our normal dialogue in the congregation to have. So much so that it ended up becoming links on the, on the congregation's website. It, it just becomes a, a culture of the congregation. And so I've really enjoyed that model. That model has helped me tremendously, even when it's, oh, I'm, look, I'm two months late doing this, that, and the third. Thank you for the reminder. And so it's just become part of that culture in that way, because the head of our congregation has modeled it and made it very regular and even shared with us some of the tips and, and um, kind of life hacks he shared with us that have come from his professional um, cadre, if you will, that he's really built around him. And I think that's something we should con continue to model. That's great. And as I know, we have a lot of um, pastors in formation on this call. I hope that that's something that um, students will take with them and do in their internship sites and in their in their calls. Um, is there anyone else you'd like to? Too, I think, you know, in this moment where so many communities are not meeting in person, I think it's also important for us to do that work of transparency and talk about the fact for me, it's every two weeks. My every two weeks is on the calendar. It's scheduled. And I think that, you know, being able to, to, to share with folks that we're going, that our appointment, oh no, I, I can't meet at that hour because, you know, with, with trusted folks, because I have an appointment with my therapist. I think being able to, to own that for ourselves and say it publicly will give other folks the unction who may reach out to you later and say, well, wh who do you go to? And how did you find them? And you know, how did you go about kind of seeking someone? I think that in the absence of, of kind of congregational life, we, we have to, to individually minister in that way and be um, transparent with folks and let them know I'm not speaking hypothetically. It's on, it's on the books. I'll be there Monday. Mm -hmm. morning, Monday. <laughs> um, and, and also, you know, preventatively, just have it on your calendar so that you, so that you don't have to wait till calamity. You know, because, you know, as a, a pastor mindset, you either coming out of a storm, in a storm, or heading into one. So have that appointment on the books so that you can go, so you can be ready to have that checkup and check in like all the others. He, but, but hopefully with more frequency as your finances and your time and your comfort level allow. Rosella, can I let you be the last voice? I just want to say that when I when I pastored uh, about seven seven years ago, I had to learn. This is for the students to learn to be brave, bold, and courageous with some non negotiables. I was in Philadelphia, where um, and you remember this. There's the largest church in Philadelphia, and Pennsylvania is a, was about a half a block down the street from us. They couldn't that pastor couldn't do all of the funerals. It was E non Baptist church um, couldn't do all the funerals, so they would come down to my church. So I was like known as the wedding and the funeral king of Mount Airy, Philadelphia. 
And um, what I realized was I was doing all of these funerals for people who were dying from diabetes and every other thing that is, you know, germane to us and in, in, in our culture um, that affects us or plagues us. And we would leave and go to the cemetery down the street, Ivy Hill Cemetery, and then come back to our beautiful social hall um, at Reformation Church and eat fried chicken, eat all the stuff. I know I said I ate chitlins, but it's once a year. Um, and all of those things. And I determined, I said, as a, as a part of holistic education and health, I said, this will be a non-negotiable. Now, you know, I said courageous because you don't mess with people's kitchens. You, especially the black women that ran those kitchens. Like you don't bother their kitchens. And I had to let them know, we are not going to continue to serve all of these things that have, we just buried this person because this person ate all this cake and pie and all this stuff like that. So I, I we had to determine that it was a healthy meal. Now what you did outside of the premises as one thing, but those, that was something that I did. And people, be, it, it allowed an opportunity for us to talk about a differentiation from um, changing uh, a culture and habits from what, what just happened, the death that just occurred, to what is promising for a better health and a better life. Mm -hmm. I got into trouble, but people lived, hopefully. Well, and I, I would say just from the standpoint of any of us who are our leaders, right, within our communities, publicly, within churches, I cannot emphasize the importance of alignment, right? It's not about what we say. What we say matters for sure, right? But it's also about how we be, right? What is the example that we are modeling for people when it comes to joy, where we started, and our health, right? And, and how are we modeling a way of being? I can't speak for every denomination, though I probably could, but I know within my denomination, right, the health issues of our rostered leaders are a problem. And, and it, it's across the board, right? I think there's obviously some other underlying factors for our Black Indigenous leaders of color, but across the board, we are not healthy. And so what does it say about how we value ourselves? And more importantly, what does it say about what we believe about who God is and how God made us, that we refuse to do the work of honoring this temple. And I'm not even someone who speaks like that. I mean, like I grew up in the South, even as a Lutheran. And so I have like, I think some residual trauma from the friends or folks that were in other communities that were much more ideologically conservative about things. But as I've gotten older, right, this is my temple. This is, this is a place where God resides where God has made a holy dwelling. And so how I treat this, right, across the board matters. And I'm not saying that from a moralistic place. I am the most aligned person sexually, spiritually, all of that. Like, I, I love my body and I love my life. And what we put in it, what how we take care of it, the energy that we engage, the ways that we, um, yeah, just embody right? This belief matters. And so we can preach all day from the pulpit, which I wish more people did because a lot of people don't, but preach it from the pulpit, teach it in your classes, provide outreach opportunities within the community, engage folks who have um, mental health, physical health, spiritual health backgrounds in your churches and your congregations to create these ministries, right? Create competitions, we're a competitive culture, do some walking, do some running, do some yoga, right? Like whatever is, is right for your context, but we have to embody it as people who believe in an incarnate God. If we are not actually living out these beliefs and our behaviors, I think we're doing a disservice and not honoring our faith in the fullest way that I think we're called to. That is the note to end on. That was so powerful, um, bringing us back to embodiment, bringing us back to all of these ways that we can find joy and ways that we can address things that get in the way of our joy. Um, Rosella Ida White, Lamont Wells, Shauna Payne Gold, Nicole Anderson Cobb, thank you so much for sharing with us so generously your wisdom, your compassion, your experience, and your joy. I, I couldn't be more thrilled um, to have you all be with us at LSTC. Thank you so very much for a lovely evening. And this is, I will, I will, I know that 
I know that we're just waving at each other because we can't see everybody else on the webinar, but um, it's been wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, we will end here for the evening. Thank you all so much for being with us and for staying with us. Um, I hope that there were things that you can take away and meditate on and use um, to cultivate joy um, in this world at this time. We look forward to seeing you at other Black History Month events. And for now, have a good evening. Goodbye.